30 years ago we cloned a sheep. Do you really believe we've never tried on people? In 1996, we cloned a sheep. The clone, named Dolly, was grown from a single mammary cell, and she lived for seven years, longer than most sheep. She was the first mammal to be cloned. That was almost 30 years ago. Do you really believe we've never tried on humans? I was that naive once. I started my freshman year at Brown in 2022, and I was looking for some laboratory experience to burnish my med school applications. Luckily, my dad had a connection, a college friend of his was a biology professor there, and he made the introduction. My first meeting with Professor Shockley took place in his office, a windowless room in the basement of the sciences complex. The walls were gray cinder block, and manuscripts were stacked everywhere in towers and mountains that sometimes reached the ceiling. I'd arrived a bit early, and I was examining the fish tank set beside one of the walls. The tank was illuminated by a single light, and rainbow fish schooled between fronds of sea grass, each fish no bigger than the nail on my pinky finger. Peter, I presume, came a voice behind me. I'd been so preoccupied that I nearly jumped out of my skin. It's okay, said the man who'd entered the room. He was tall and thin, with the kind of wiry muscling that only old men have, like they've been cured in the sun. He had lined cheeks and a mane of snowy hair, and he wore a crisp white lab coat. They're beautiful, aren't they? He asked, folding his arms behind his back and leaning in beside me to observe the fish tank. They are, I replied. They're neon tetras, right? Good eye. Your dad didn't tell me you were an aquarist. I had a few tetras of my own when I was a kid. Ah, but these aren't just any tetras. Can you tell me what's special about these specimens? I leaned in closer. The fish were beautiful, but they didn't look any different than the ones I'd owned. I shook my head. I'm really sorry, but I can't tell the difference. He smiled broadly. There was something in his smile that seed a bit off, how wide his lips went, the way they curled over his teeth. That's the special part, he told me, settling in behind his desk and gesturing for me to sit opposite. They're just like any other tetras. But these are clones. I instantly felt excited. My dad hadn't given me many details on Shockley's work, but I was sure that cloning would look irresistible to med school admissions committees. I spent the rest of the meeting nodding enthusiastically at whatever Shockley said, and, 15 minutes later, we shook hands when he offered me a research associate position in his lab. I spent the next month getting up to speed. Most research labs at Brown had around a dozen members, but Shockley's was an exception. The only other member was a PhD student named Elizabeth, a mousy and dark-haired girl of Eastern European origin. She mostly kept to herself, barricaded in the room down the narrow hallway that housed the growing tanks and reagents. I busied myself in Shockley's office reading hundreds of protocols and journal articles, some of which I needed to translate from Russian, Chinese, and Korean. All the while, I wondered what was behind the heavy steel door that led to the lab. As I read more about protocols for cell growth and culture mediums, my transactional interest gave way to genuine curiosity. The loud thunk of the lock turning became an irresistible siren song. Shockley himself was even more of an enigma. I only saw him a few times during my month of reading, but it seemed like he never left the lab, working day and night even after Elizabeth left each day around 11. What are you two doing back there? I asked her finally, once I'd worked up the courage. The professor will tell you when he thinks you are ready. That took another month, during which I spent nearly every night reading in Shockley's office, while the school of clone Tetris swirled in their tank behind me. I was walking out around midnight one day when Shockley spotted me in the hallway. Peter. You're not leaving, are you? Yeah. Is that okay? I have an econ midterm tomorrow morning. A look almost like anger washed over his face, but it was gone in an instant. Econ, huh? Is that something that interests you? I shrugged. I figure it's a good thing to learn. You know, to get more well-rounded and all. He shook his head. Our best and brightest come to our greatest universities, and get so preoccupied with hedging their bets. In evolution, it's the specialists who survive. The ones who go all in on something. Remember that, Peter. I wasn't really sure what he was getting going at, but it was clear I'd touched some nerve. Of course, Professor. He glanced behind him. Listen, before you go, would you like to see the lab? 
Any tiredness I'd been feeling evaporated. It was like an electric current had run through me. Yes, I replied instantly. Come, he said, whipping around. I rushed to follow him. A paper sign was affixed to the door to the lab, do not enter. Shockley reached into his pocket and fished out a key ring. One of the keys was big and brass, the second silver, the third small and iron, with a pair of wings on the top. The brass key opened the door, and he held it open. After you. The lab was much bigger than I'd anticipated. As Shockley led me through the various bench tops and sterile hoods, showing off the huge closets full of glassware and reagents, I got the impression that this lab was better suited to a group of 30 scientists or more, and certainly too large for just Shockley and Elizabeth. You have more fish back here, I observed, pointing to a glass tank that was almost as tall as I was. 5,000 tetras, give or take, Shockley said. Plus, drosophila and mice. And they're all. He smiled. Clones. Of course. There was a small cage nestled between two sterile hoods in the back of the room. What lives in there? I asked. That's Betty's crate, Shockley replied. Betty. She's around here somewhere. I know it's forbidden in the lab, but I like to let her roam free. Something bumped against the back of my calf, and I looked down to see a beagle sniffing my leg. The dog's fur was mottled with gray patches, and one of her eyes was cloudy. I bent down to scratch her behind the ears. I do have one rule, though, Shockley told me, suddenly serious. No gum. I felt my cheeks redden. Of course. I'm sorry. It's perfectly fine, he said. There's a trash can in the corner over there. The next day, after my midterm, Shockley called me into his office and asked me if I was ready for my first project. You'll be cloning Tetras, he told me, after I enthusiastically agreed. I assume you're familiar with the protocol. I had read dozens of papers on this very subject, and I told him so. That's good, he said. Can you start tonight? Thankfully, cloning fish wasn't too difficult, just time-consuming. I regularly stayed in the lab past midnight, spending nearly a month preparing donor cells and collecting eggs ejected from female tetras. The micromanipulation, the transfer of the cultured donor cell nuclei to the donated eggs, was the trickiest part, but Elizabeth helped me out after two failed solo attempts. By Christmas break, I had a dozen cloned eggs. I spent two days on pins and needles, hardly leaving the otherwise empty tank reserved for my experiment. When the first fry emerged from their shells, thin as eyelashes, I nearly cried with relief. I let my fish grow when I went home for the break. Two weeks later, they'd grown nearly to full size. I scooped some into a cup and carefully walked down the hallway to show Shockley. He held the cup up, examining the fish up close. These are spectacular, he said. Then, to my surprise, he dumped the cup of fish into the tank in his office. It was the greatest compliment he could have paid me. I think you're ready for the next step, he said. Mammalian cloning. My heart began to hammer hard in my chest. Amazing, I said, hardly believing my luck. The mice. He shook his head. Not mice. And not the normal surrogate protocol, either. It's time I show you my greatest achievement. I thought that he would lead me back into the lab. Instead, he led me up the dimly lit staircase that opened directly onto the sidewalk. Night had fallen, and slush piles took on an eerie glow beneath the greenish moonlight. My shoes squelched as I followed him to a nearby alley, where he'd parked his car. Going off campus? I asked him. It wasn't uncommon for labs to be distributed across the main campus, atop College Hill, and the med school campus, which lay on the other side of the Providence River. That's right, he said, with a twinkle in his eye. I didn't think much of it, and I climbed into the passenger seat. Providence is a small town, and it was clear almost immediately that we weren't headed to the med school. Don't worry, Peter, said Shockley. It won't be far. His eyes remained on the road, which weaved sinuously between old brick buildings. Something like worry perched in my stomach, but what for? Shockley might have been eccentric, but he wasn't a creep. Besides, wouldn't my dad have mentioned something? We drove past the football stadium, which stood almost two miles from campus. Shockley pulled to a stop outside a small two-story house. You live here? I asked. I do. 
I hope you don't mind. I keep a laboratory at home, you see. The university administration mostly leaves me alone, but if they knew about this, they'd shut me down. Or demand I publish my work. I'm not sure which is worse. He laughed at his own joke, a harsh barking sound. I laughed, too. Despite making a mental list of everything that could go wrong, I followed him into the house. We passed through the bare foyer and the austere living room, out the sliding glass door that led to the backyard. There was a wooden shed there, and Shockley drew out his key ring. It was then that I saw the use of the second key, the silver one. Shockley turned the lock and led us inside. He shut the door behind us, and moonlight seeped in through the gaps between the door slats. There was a hatch on the floor, and Shockley pulled it open. It's a short way down, he said. I'll be right behind you. This was a step too far. Would you mind going first? I asked uncomfortably. He smiled, as though he knew what I'd been worrying over. Not at all, Peter. He stepped into the hatch and disappeared into the darkness. I heard only the hollow clang of his footsteps on the rungs of the ladder before the sounds, too, faded away. I followed after him. Luckily, the ladder only descended twenty feet or so. My feet hit solid ground, smooth tile. I could hear Shockley breathing a few feet away. Where are we? I asked. My voice echoed, and I knew that we were in a tunnel. I built my shed over an old well that used to be on this property, he replied, moving down the tunnel. I followed after him, my hand tracing over the wall. A curious thing, it never seemed to fill, no matter how much it rained. One day, after a few too many whiskeys, I rappelled down to find a secret door at its base. That led to a tunnel, the same one in which we find ourselves now. Who built it? I asked. The abolitionists who built this house, I suppose. This place probably lay along the Underground Railroad. They didn't call it Providence Plantations for nothing. He had stopped. There was a low, bassy noise, like a huge cat awakening with a purr. Blinding white light flooded my eyes, which flashed with pain. Thankfully, it didn't take me long to adjust. I saw that we were in a small room, something that almost reminded me of a dungeon. The walls were old stone that glistened with moisture that seeped down from the low ceiling. There was a faint mildew scent, but it was overpowered by something much stronger, the unmistakable scent of blood. But I didn't linger on the smell long. My attention was firmly fixed on something else. In the center of the room stood a huge machine. It looked almost like a French press, a glass cylinder four feet across and nine feet tall. It was filled with a viscous red liquid. Pipes and tubes snaked from the top of its dome to the control panel on the wall, as well as to the series of metal containers on the floor. What is that? I asked. This, said Shockley, and there was unmistakable pride in his voice, this is the Gaia. It's the culmination of my life's work. I stepped closer to the machine. Without asking, I pressed my hand to the glass. It was warm, and I felt a subtle pulse from within, as though it had a heartbeat. This close, the smell of blood was even more potent, flooding my nostrils and nearly making me wretch. What does it do? I asked, my curiosity getting the better of my nausea. The onerous part of the cloning process is transplantation, Shockley explained. Finding a surrogate to carry the cloned embryo is inefficient. Animals do what we bid them, but what about creatures from whom we seek consent? I've solved that problem. Transplant a blastocyst to this chamber, and it will grow. A gasp caught in my throat. From the day I met him, it was apparent that Shockley was a genius, but this, this was world-changing. Is he telling the truth? I wondered, searching his lined face. I didn't get the chance to inquire. Peter, I'd like for you to learn how to use it, said Shockley. Yes, I replied immediately. I won't go through all of the details here. It took Shockley nearly three hours to explain his protocol, all of the reagents he'd obtained, the order in which to add them, the precise temperatures and pH levels to be maintained. By the time we climbed back out of the shed, day had broken. Still, I was too excited to sleep. Shockley gave me a copy of his silver key. That night, I caught a cab to his house and ventured down again to start the project he'd given me. I didn't attend a single class that month. What was the point? Nothing I'd learn in econ could begin to approach Shockley's work in significance. 
I spent every free moment in Shockley's underground lab, culturing the cells that he'd obtained from his dog, Betty. Even more significant than Shockley's construction of the Gaia was the protocol he developed for genetically editing the embryos. A beagle's gestational period was around nine weeks. But, inside Gaia, the modified embryos grew at double speed. Even though I only needed to check the growing embryos a few times a week, I spent hours in front of the Gaia, just watching the cells multiply, brain, eyes, legs, tail. I had cultured three embryos, all three appeared viable. I could hardly believe my success. The long-awaited day arrived in the waning days of March, when Shockley came down to the lab and declared that the beagles had finished growing. He hit a button on the control panel, and, with a groan, the liquid began to drain from the Gaia and into one of the circulatory tanks. It was gone in a few minutes. There was pneumatically sealed hatch at the base of the cylinder, and I pulled it open. The puppies shuffled inside. Oh, my god, was the only thing I could say. I scooped each one into the soft pink towel that I prepared for this very occasion. All three of them were perfect, more precious than jewels. Well done, said Shockley, clapping me on the back. He smiled his wolfish smile and gestured for the bundle of puppies. Each one was no bigger than my hand, and he held each one gently as he examined the features. Excellent work. These are perfect specimens. I was about to thank him, when Shockley snatched up the first puppy. He wrapped his fingers around its neck and gave a sharp tug. There was an awful, wet crack, and the body went limp. What the, was all I could get out before he took the other two puppies from me, repeating the same gruesome procedure. The pink towel began to bleed. I could barely get out a single word. I stared at him venomously. Why, why did you do that? I demanded, leaping forward and seizing him by the lapels of his white coat. He looked at me with pity. Take your hands off me, Peter, he said, eerily calm. I don't understand why you're so upset. Why? You just murdered three puppies. Like it was nothing. What's the matter with you? He laughed, and I felt my grip tighten. I'm not done teaching you, he said. You still cling to the notion that life is precious. But that's simply not true. Didn't we just create it, from nothing? Life is no more valuable than money is, money that we print from thin air. They were puppies. That elicited a louder laugh from him. As if that makes any matter. The universe is indifferent either way. There is no God, and, if there is, he cares no more for the life of a puppy than he does for an oyster. And we just created life, my boy. So tell me, what does that make us? I had no retort. Shockley coiled his hands around my wrists. His skin was icy cold. Now, Peter, let me go. I don't know what it was about his voice, but there was a sudden menace in it. In an instant, he seemed more gaunt than ever, the skin of his face almost transparent. It was like Shockley was no longer a man, but a skeleton, fleshless, bloodless. I couldn't help my stomach. I doubled over and vomited all over the floor. Shockley straightened his coat. You'll have to clean that up, he said casually. Come by the office tomorrow. We'll chat about your next project. He sauntered back down the hallway. Oh, he added, stopping briefly. His eyes were the only points of illumination, like torches in the darkness. Don't forget the specimens. I was too terrified to disobey. I thought about calling my dad, but what would I tell him that he'd believe? So I found my way to Shockley's office the next day, though not before stopping by the army surplus store on Thayer Street for a can of mace and a tactical knife. Shockley had been poring over a draftsman sketch on his desk. It looked to be the Gaia in replicate, at least 20 of the machines lined up side by side. At the top of the page was a detailed drawing of a pair of wings. Plans for the future? I wondered. He looked up when I entered, and he appeared amused to see me. Feeling better, he asked, stowing the sketch. I remained mute. You might get a kick out of this, he said. He took a photograph off his desk and showed it to me. It's me and your dad, back in our college days. Pretty neat, huh? Both men had aged. While my dad had lost his hair, Shockley had retained his, though not the fiery auburn coloring he possessed in his youth. I guess so, I told him coolly, handing the photo back to him. You mentioned another project. He nodded. Yes. 
this. He pulled open one of his desk drawers and revealed a scroll of paper, which he unfurled before him. Almost instantly, I knew what it was. You can't be serious, I told him. I would never joke about something like this. You don't have the stomach. I shook my head. Puppies, that was one thing. But to clone a human? How could you even think about something like that? He was silent for a moment. When he spoke, his voice was quiet. The lesson I taught you last night. A difficult one, I know, but it seems it sunk it, else why would you be here? You're a smart boy, Peter. Surely, you followed the argument to its natural extension. Life isn't precious. What about human life? I asked. His eyes widened, fixed me like spotlights. His voice seemed to drop an octave. Any life. Why not do this yourself? I asked, when I regained my voice. Why bring me into it? He smiled wanly. The conclusion of my argument. What am I, but an oyster? I felt my eyes narrow. Does that mean? His hand went to his belly. Stomach cancer. They caught it late, as always. Nothing to do. How long? I asked, unsure whether or not I believed him. Six months, he told me. His voice was emotionless, like he'd told me about a late package delivery instead. Maybe less. Now, do you see? You wanted someone to continue your work. He smiled. I told you, you're a smart boy. And I wanted to teach someone young, too, someone with more years for experimentation. Have I explained myself enough? I nodded. One last question. Cloning humans, is this your first time? His eyes twinkled with amusement. Why, of course. We made plans to reconvene in his shed the next day. I arrived just before midnight. Shockley stood before the Gaia, the machine pulsing malevolently. You're early, he told me. That's good. I've procured the cells we'll be culturing. Whose? He shrugged. Some undergrad. People are too careless with where they leave their DNA. Shall we begin? I nodded. My stomach was stretched tight. My heart pounded in my ears. Shockley turned away from me, towards the control panel, and that was my moment. I lunged forward. The knife was already in my hand. The blade sunk in just beneath his right shoulder blade. Fabric, skin, flesh, none offered resistance. I removed the knife and stabbed him again. The kidney this time, then the liver. He sank to his knees. I walked to face him. There were a million things I could have said, some one-liner like a Hollywood star might give. But I had nothing. He opened his mouth, as if to say something. But there was just a low exhale, and a dribble of blood. His eyes were full of rage. And then, in an instant, they weren't. I spent the next hour destroying the Gaia, smashing it apart with a baseball that I'd brought with me and hidden outside. The red liquid surged in a thunderous wave, carrying broken glass and mangled bits of metal. My shoes were soaked through. Shockley's arms began to float, ever so slightly. I didn't care if people found the lab. There was no way they'd figure out what the ruins of the Gaia were for. Hell, the police might have suspected Shockley of cooking meth. I poured a layer of gasoline over the floor, over Shockley's body. When I was all the way up the ladder, I dropped a lit match down. I felt the heat blast my face, hotter than a furnace. I spent the next few weeks waiting for Shockley's death to become public. I was satisfied that I'd covered my tracks, but, with each day that passed without any news, I began to worry. Maybe the police have found some evidence, I thought, terrified. Maybe they're building a case, and that's why I haven't heard anything. I visited Shockley's lab on campus a few times. Of course, he wasn't there. Neither was Elizabeth. Where had she gone? I thought the story ended there. But it didn't. Last week, I saw a man getting out of his car a block from the sciences building. He was around 25, with auburn hair. He looked very familiar. It can't be, I thought, but I'd seen the old picture, hadn't I? The men caught my eye, and I was paralyzed, the same way a mouse freezes before a cat. A smile filled the his face, the gums curling over the teeth. 
Without saying a word, he pointed at me. With his other hand, he held up one finger, and then two.